Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales. Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales, 19 February 1594, 6 November 1612, was the eldest son and heir apparent of James V.I. and I, King of England and Scotland, and his wife Anne of Denmark. His name derives from his grandfathers, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, and Frederick Roman II of Denmark. Prince Henry was widely seen as a bright and promising heir to his father's thrones. However, at the age of 18, he predeceased his father when he died of typhoid fever. His younger brother Charles succeeded him as heir apparent to the English, Irish, and Scottish thrones. Early Life Henry was born at Stirling Castle, Scotland, and became Duke of Rothesay, Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles and Prince and Great Steward of Scotland automatically on his birth. His nurses included Mistress Primrose and Mistress Bruce. Henry's baptism on 30 August 1594 was celebrated with complex theatrical entertainments written by poet William Fowler and a ceremony in a new chapel royal at Stirling Purpose built by William Shaw. James V.I. set a tax of £100,000 with the expenses. Textiles and costume for the event were bought using an's dowry of £100,000 which had been in the safekeeping of various towns. In the month before the baptism, there were rumours at the Scottish court that James V.I. was jealous of Anne of Denmark and thought that the Duke of Lennox might be the father of Prince Henry. His father placed him in the care of John Erskine, Earl of Mar and his mother Annabel Murray at Stirling Castle, out of the care of the boy's mother. James V.I. worried that the mother's tendency toward Catholicism might affect the son. The child's removal to Stirling caused enormous tension between Anne and James, and Henry remained there under the care of Mar's family until 1603. James V.I. wrote a note to the Earl of Mar in June 1595 instructing him, in the event his death, not to deliver Henry to Anne of Denmark or the Parliament of Scotland until he was 18 and gave the order himself. James V.I. frequently visited the prince at Stirling. As early as August 1595, he encouraged the infant to hold a pen and make a pen stroke on a document, which the king humorously certified. I will testify this is the prince's own mark. Adam Newton was his schoolmaster or tutor. William Keith of Dilnai and then George Lauder were his legal tutors, administrators of his estates and incomes. In 1596, Queen Elizabeth. It was said that Prince Henry would be godfather to his younger brother, Duke Robert, in May 1602, and afterwards stay at Dunfermline Palace with his mother. But James V.I. forbade this. In 1602, a visit to his mother at Falkland Palace was planned, but was postponed because of her sickness. James became King of England in 1603 at the Union of the Crowns, and his family moved south. Anne of Denmark came to Stirling to collect her son, and after a struggle was allowed to take Henry to Edinburgh on 28 May, and on the following Sunday took him to St. Giles Kirk in her famous silver coach, and they subsequently travelled to England. Henry's tutor, Adam Newton, continued to serve the prince, and several Scottish servants from the Stirling household were retained, including the poet David Murray. The prince was lodged at Oaklands and Nonsuch Palace, and was relocated to Winchester during an outbreak of plague. At Winchester, in September 1603, Anne of Denmark produced a mask to welcome her son, which was controversial. In November 1603, he was staying at Wilton House and rode with the Earl of Nottingham and his governor, Sir Thomas Chaloner, to Salisbury to dine with the Venetian ambassador, Niccolo Mollin, and other diplomats. This was the first time he had made an appearance and dined outside the royal household, and his father joked that Henry was the ambassador's prisoner. From 1604 onwards, Henry often stayed at St. James's Palace. The gardens were improved for him by Alphonsus Fowl. The daily expenses of the prince in England were managed by the coffer of the household, Henry Cock, and after 1610 David Foley's. David Murray of Gorthy was keeper of the prince's privy purse, and his accounts reveal some details of Henry's interests.
music, games, and sports, and sports, and sports, sports, and sports, sports, and 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 sports, sports, and sports, and sports. Prince Henry was introduced to a variety of sports at Stirling Castle. In September 1600, he was bought two golf clubs, two staffs, and four rackets. The handles were covered with velvet and dressed with metal passementry. On Sunday, 8 May 1603, he exercised in the castle garden, watched by his mother, played billiards after dinner, and after supper ran and played at the boards. In England, Henry was tutored in music by Alfonso Ferrabosco, the younger Nicholas Villiard, and Walter Quinn. Thomas Giles taught him to dance. At Oatlands in 1603, Prince Henry told Scaramelli, a Venetian diplomat, about his interests in dancing, tennis, and hunting. In August 1604, Henry danced for the Spanish envoy, the constable Velasco, and showed him military pike exercises in the palace garden. In 1606, the French ambassador Antoine Lefebvre de la Baudry noted that Prince Henry played golf, which he described as a Scottish game not unlike Pally Mail or Paul Mall. One of Prince Henry's biographers, W. H., mentioned that Henry nearly hit Adam Newton with a golf ball, and Henry said that would have paid him back. Henry also played tennis and in July 1606 played with his uncle Christian Roman IV of Denmark at Greenwich Palace. He had a court for Paul Mall, laid out at St. James Fields, north of St. James's Palace. It was a long alley surfaced with cockle shells crushed into clay or loam. In 1607 Henry sought permission to learn to swim, but the Earls of Suffolk and Shrewsbury wrote to Newton that swimming was a dangerous thing that their own sons might practice like feathers as light as things of naught, but was not suitable for princes as things of great weight and consequence. A riding school, one of the first in England, was built for him at St. James's Palace in 1607. Henry talked of the merits of various breeds of horses and his own Barbary horses to the Venetian ambassador Antonio Foscarini in 1611. He revealed an interest in Venetian maritime power, and had a plan of the fortification of Palmanovo. Training and personality. The king greatly preferred the role of schoolmaster to that of father, and he wrote texts for the schooling of his children. James directed that Henry's household should rather imitate a college than a court, or, as Sir Thomas Chaloner wrote in 1607, his highness's household was intended by the king for a courtly college or a collegiate court, he passionately engaged in such physical pursuits as hawking, hunting, jousting, and fencing, and from a year he also disapproved of the way his father conducted the royal court, disliked Robert Carr, a favorite of his father, and esteemed Sir Walter Raleigh, wishing him to be released from the Tower of London. The prince's popularity rose so high that it threatened his father. Relations between the two could be tense, and on occasion surfaced in public. At one point, they were hunting near Royston, when James criticized his son for lacking enthusiasm for the chase, and Henry initially moved to strike his father with a cane, but rode off. Most of the hunting party then followed the son. Upright to the point of priggishness, he fined all who swore in his presence, according to Charles Carleton, a biographer of Charles I, who describes Henry as an obdurate Protestant. In addition to the alms box to which Henry forced swearers to contribute, he made sure his household attended church services. His religious views were influenced by the clerics in his household, who came largely from a tradition of politicized Calvinism. Henry listened humbly, attentively, and regularly to the sermons preached to his household, and once told his chaplain, Richard Milbourne, that he esteemed most the preachers whose attitude suggested Sir, you must hear me diligently, you must have a care to observe what I say. Henry is said to have disliked his younger brother, Charles, and to have teased him. Charles stamped on the cap and had to be dragged off in tears. Investiture and Leadership 
with his father's accession to the throne of England in 1603, Henry at once became Duke of Cornwall. In 1610 he was further invested as Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester, thus for the first time uniting the six automatic and two traditional Scottish and English titles held by heirs apparent to the two thrones. The ceremony of investiture was celebrated with a pageant London's love to Prince Henry and a mask, Tethys Festival, during which his mother gave a sword encrusted with diamonds intended to represent justice. As a young man, Henry showed great promise and was beginning to be active in leadership matters. Among his activities, he was responsible for the reassignment of Sir Thomas Dale to the Virginia Company of London's struggling colony in North America. The Irish Gaelic Lord of Inishowen, Sir Cahir O'Doherty, had applied to gain a position as a courtier in the household of Henry to help him in his struggles against officials in Ireland. Unknown to Sir Cahir, on 19 April 1608, the day he launched O'Doherty's rebellion by burning Derry, his application was approved. Henry took an interest in the Kingdom of Ireland and was known to be supportive of the idea of a reconciliation with the former rebel Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, who had fled into exile during the flight of the earls. Because of this Tyrone and his entourage mourned when the prince met his early death. In 1611, King James gave Woodstock Palace in Oxfordshire to Prince Henry. Henry had a banqueting house built of leafy tree branches in the park, in which he held a dinner for his parents and his sister Princess Elizabeth. David Murray paid 110 shillings for transporting musical instruments from London to Woodstock for the event. The city of Henricus in colonial Virginia was named in his honor in 1611. His name also survives in Henrico County, Virginia and Cape Henry. Death Henry died from typhoid fever at the age of 18 during the celebrations that led up to his sister Elizabeth's wedding. The diagnosis can be made with reasonable certainty from written records of the post-mortem examination, which was ordered to be carried out in order to dispel rumors of poisoning. It was reported that his last words were to ask for his sister, Princess Elizabeth. After Henry's death, the prince's brother Charles fell ill, but he was the chief mourner at the funeral which King James, who detested funerals, refused to attend. The body lay in state at St. James's Palace for four weeks. On 7 December, over a thousand people walked in the mile-long cortege to Westminster Abbey to hear a two-hour sermon delivered by George Abbott, the Archbishop of Canterbury. As Henry's body was lowered into the ground, his chief servants broke their staves of office at the grave. Prince Henry's death was widely regarded as a tragedy for the nation. According to Charles Carleton, few heirs to the English throne have been as widely and deeply mourned as Prince Henry. Henry's titles of Duke of Cornwall and Duke of Rothesay passed to Charles, who until then had lived in Henry's shadow. Four years later, Charles, by then sixteen years old, was created Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester. Literature and music occasioned by the prince's death. Sermons. Henry's chaplain, Daniel Price, delivered a series of sermons about the young man's death. Price borrowed from John Donne's unrelated The First Anniversary, published in 1611, and The Second Anniversary, published in 1612, for some of his language and ideas. The ideas. Lamentations for the Death of the Late Illustrious Prince Henry, Two Sermons, 1613, C. 1613 in Literature. Oh, why is there not a general thaw throughout all mankind? Spiritual Odors to the Memory of Prince Henry. In four of the last sermons preached in St. James after His Highness Death Oxford, 1613, C. 1613 in Literature, from Meditations of Consolation in Our Lamentations. His body was so fair and strong that a soul might have been pleased to live an age in it. Virtue and valor, beauty and chastity, arms and arts. Tears shed over a nerve. The sermon preached on the Sunday before the prince's funeral in St. James Chapel before the body Oxford, 1613, C. 1613 in literature. He, he is dead who, while he lived, was a perpetual paradise, 
every season that he shewed himself in a perpetual spring every exercise wherein he was seen a special felicity he he is dead before prose memorials Price also wrote two prose anniversaries on the death Prince Henry his first anniversary Oxford 1613 c 1613 in literature in him a glimmering light of the golden times appear all lines of expectation met in this center all spirits of virtue scattered into others were extracted into him won't to him to him whom him him another anniversary published in 1614 verses within a few months of the prince's death at least 32 poets had versified on it in addition to those listed below the writers included sir walter raleigh a friend john don edward herbert thomas haywood and henry king these poems were published in 1612 c 1612 in poetry sir william alexander an elegy on the death of prince henry Rins. 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 joshua sylvester lacrimi lacrimarum or the distillation of tears sheet for the untimely death of the incomparable prince panaretus also includes poems in english french latin and italian by walter quinn 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 george wither prince henry's obsequies or mournful elegies upon his death these poems and songs were published in 1613 c 1613 in poetry thomas campion songs of mourning bewailing the untimely death of prince henry verse and music music by giovanni coprario or Caprario, said to have been john cooper an englishman george chapman an epicede or funeral song on the most disastrous death of the high-born prince of men henry prince of wales and c the work states sixteen twelve but was published in sixteen thirteen john davies the muses tears for the loss of their hope william drummond of holthornden tears on the death of moliads mary oxley or oxley a scottish poetess living in morpeth wrote a response to william drummond of holthornden's moliads which was published in sixteen fifty six music in addition to the above verse setting by coprario both thomas tompkins and thomas wilkes composed settings of when david heard a biblical passage in which King David laments the loss of his son Absalom in battle, it is thought that both settings were directly inspired by the death of the prince. The Oxford Dictionary of National Biography refers to a morning song in memory of Prince Henry by John Ward remaining unpublished during the composer's lifetime, however, a newly composed song on the same subject was included in his first set of madrigals, 1613. Titles, Styles Honors and arms. Titles. 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 19 February 1594, 6 November 1612. The Duke of Rothesay, Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, Prince and Great Steward of Scotland. 24 March 1603, 6 November 1612. The Duke of Cornwall. 4 June 1610, 6 November 1612 the Prince of Wales, Earl of Chester, Duke of Cornwall, and Rothesay, Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, Prince, and Great Steward of Scotland. Honours K.G., Knight of the Garter, 14 June 1603. Arms Henry Frederick, as Prince of Wales, bore the arms of the kingdom, differenced by a label of three points argent. Ancestry